Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey, 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 welcome to the Touch MBA Podcast, episode 27. This is your host, Darren, and it's been a great week for us here at Touch MBA. Six top schools from Europe and Asia have signed up to be Touch MBA partner schools, which means when you come to touchmba.com and you sign up for school selection help, you not only get advice on, on your profile and school recommendations from me, but you can also get your profile assessed by these six top business schools with one click. So I think this is gonna be a great service and we'll definitely have more schools joining us soon. If you still need help figuring out which schools to apply to, go head over to touchmba.com, get yourself signed up, and I look forward to meeting you over there. This week, we're speaking with Ms. Libby Livingston from Emory University's Goizueta School of Business. This is a really unique program in the US that can be finished in one or two years. It's really small, you know, about 150 students in the two-year program, 50 students in the one-year program, and the school had the best placement percentage out of all the top 25 schools in the US in 2012 and the greatest jump in salary as well. So it's a really uh, small, intimate, and market-oriented program. Um, let's get started. Welcome future MBAs to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. This is your host, Darren. Today, we're gonna to be talking to Miss Libby Livingston, who's the Director of Admissions for the two-year MBA program at Goizueta Business School, which is part of Emory University. Libby has been working for Goizueta for over 13 years, so I'm sure she has a lot to share about this program that's consistently ranked in the top 20 and is quite unique in the way it is structured and offered. So I'm just really looking forward to learning much more about this program along with you, and welcome to the show, Libby. Thank you so much, Darren. I'm excited to be able to share about our program today with the students. Fantastic. So Libby, what makes the Goizueta MBA unique from other top business schools in the U.S. and in the world? Goizueta Business School's full-time MBA is one of the only programs in the U.S. that offers three things. First, a world-class and innovative MBA curriculum in both a two-year as well as a one-year format. And we have a very highly engaged and intimate learning environment. Our class size for our two-year program is about 150. For our one-year program, it's between 45 and 50 students. We also have connections with the business community of our dynamic and very global city of Atlanta. And the outcomes of successfully delivering on this value proposition are high degrees of student success as well as alumni engagement. We focus on day one readiness. Students hear about day one readiness a lot when they start our program. Our focus is on our students being exceptionally well prepared for day one in the classroom of first job interview, um, of their internships, and of their post MBA careers. Core tools are practiced in the first year and include the functional disciplines, but as well, structured problem solving, professional communication, and professional development, which is part of our management practice program, um, where MP is an opportunity, um, as we call it, MP, for students to practice their management and analytical skills in a real-world setting. So we've really embraced this experiential way of learning. And we also focus on students having a leadership presence. The recruiters have shared with us the need for all MBA students to improve their communication and leadership skills. So in addition to the communication and leadership courses, we actually have a leadership course that students take the semester before their summer internship, as well as the semester after their summer internship. And students have the opportunity to do our Advanced Leadership Academy, which is our experiential piece of our leadership program. I think it's very unique, as you mentioned, that Goizueta has both a one-year and a two-year option, especially for you know a school that's that's top ranked. And does the one-year cohort interact with the two-year cohort at all, or are they separate? That's a great question because the students in the one-year program actually start 
in early May, and they do all the core courses in the summer, and then they join the rising second year students in our two-year program for the fall and the spring, and then they graduate. So it's a three-semester program and it's for individuals that really want to accelerate their career. They're not making a big career switch, and it allows students to do it in one year, which is great. And do those one-year students feel like they really get that full U.S. MBA experience? They do. I mean, I think that students that come into the one-year program, as I mentioned, the summer is very intense. When they join, you know, rising second-year students, they get involved in all of our clubs. Um, We actually reserve leadership positions specifically for one-year students, so they're able to take on leadership roles within the clubs and organizations that they want to be involved in. Yeah. And students have access to all the same opportunities as our two-year students. Unfortunately, they cannot study abroad for a full semester, but we have a mid-semester module trip that students take in the spring semester. And one year and two-year students do that. So a lot of students get a great international experience through that program. And then, of course, they don't have the internship. So those are the two main differences. It's not an internship as well as not being able to study abroad for a full semester but they have access to everything else, just like a two-year student has. What are the advantages and disadvantages of studying in a relatively small cohort of 45 to 50 students in the one-year program and 150 students in the two-year program? With the two-year program, we split them up into three cohorts. So one cohort that students have taken all their classes with during that first semester, whether you're in the one-year program or the two-year program, your cohort is about that large. And students are able, in the one-year program, when they join the rights of second-year students, they become a part of now the students that just enrolled the class of 2014. They're not really thought of as much as a one-year student anymore. You know, they're part of the class of 2014. They're really integrated into that program. And we work hard to make sure that that integration goes smoothly. For example, when students are here in the summer, our two-year students for internship, we do some social events to introduce the one-year students to um, the upcoming second-year students for the fall so that they can start to meet them and interact with them and network with them. It's a great opportunity to have such a small group to go through your core with, but then you get to join this larger class. And so the graduating class ends up being closer to about 200 when you combine the one-year and the two-year students. Libby, could you talk to us a bit more about what you meant by experiential learning? And how does Gozueta really emphasize this in its curriculum? We want students to be able to have real-world experiences while they are here. We feel that's really important to prepare them for going out in the business world, in this global business world. And through our MP, our Management Practice Program, which allows students to practice their management skills, we have focused on structured problem solving. So, for example, in the past, and some students things are different each year, but we've had consultants come in and teach our students how to look at problems. And, and break it down. So if you were a consultant and you were going into a project, how you would start, you know, how you would break down that problem and structure it. And we think that that is something that all students can really find valuable. And so that is the focus that we look at. Um, we also want students to be able to look at a case not just from one angle. You know, when you're taking marketing, a lot of times you're focused on a case in the marketing area, but we'll take cases through MP and look at it from several different angles. So one case, but let's look at it from marketing perspective as well as the finance perspective and allowing students to get that 360 degree view of the business and the business case. And so I think that students find that really valuable instead of studying a silo and being able to see that broader perspective. We want students to be able to have a tolerance for ambiguity. So they're uncomfortable in situations that are ambiguous. And so we want students to really get comfortable with that because you're going to be dealing with that a lot in the business world. And so that's something that we focus on as well. Allowing students to have that type of focus during their first semester, but then also really being able in that second semester when they start taking their electives, they're able to select a course within their area of interest, their functional area of interest, that's really experiential. So within finance, they take valuations, or within marketing, they might want to do our um, new product lab course, or they might want to take our Web Marketing Strategy Consultancy course that is very experiential and allows students to almost have an internship experience before they've even started their internship. 
which is great. And we also have an MP program that's structured for our one-year students as well. So it's in both programs. And on that note, is Gazueta particularly strong in any discipline? We are a general management program, and we have five concentration areas, marketing, finance, organization and management, information systems and operations management, and accounting. But the main three areas of concentration for our students is consulting, marketing, and finance. There's not one area that really dominates each year, kind of divided between those three areas. And of course, there are students that are interested in other areas as well, but those are the largest. They vary from year to year on the percentage that want to go into certain functional areas. I noticed that Goizueta had a marketing analytics center. Yes. Which is quite interesting, along with a social enterprise center and alternative investment center. Could you talk to us a little bit more about these three different centers? Definitely. And you're talking about exciting developments. I know that that is something that you want to talk about today. Yes. And these are the areas that I would like to share with you because I think they are definitely exciting developments that we have here, and I want to talk about each one briefly. So first, we have Social Enterprise at Guizueta, and this center focuses on integrating business principles and market-based solutions in order to achieve meaningful societal impacts. Um, we educate our students in how business acumen can be applied to address really a wide range of challenges. All of our centers have great websites, so I'm talking, I encourage students to definitely try to get on our website and take a look at this information it has profiles on students that are involved in the center. The Emory Marketing and Analytics Center combines science-based testing and rigor to inform management's vision for the future. Yeah. The Emory MAC is a research and education center housed at Guizueta, whose purpose falls under three broad areas, and it's teaching and education outreach, and research. And then our last center is the Emory Center for Alternative Investment, CHI, as we call it, CAI, focuses on developing research and information, providing education, and building community with respect to several areas of alternative investment, including private equity, hedge funds, and venture capital, and real estate. And in addition to these classes that students can take, students have the opportunity to take advantage of the center's extensive alumni network that we have, as well as an internship program abroad. Mm. So we have had students be able to go work, for example, in India and do private equity. So with these centers, what's really neat is that students can actually apply to be a fellow in these centers. And being a fellow is basically like an assistantship. And so during the admissions process, students can fill out just a small additional essay regarding the center that you're interested in applying for. And you basically apply during the round that you plan to apply for. You submit an essay on that same deadline. And then the faculty that oversee the centers review those applications and then select fellows that have an assistantship that get paid to be able to, to work in these centers, um, which is a great opportunity. And students, you know, maybe they're not interested in being a fellow, but any student that comes to our program, they're able to participate and get involved in these centers, which is a great opportunity and an exciting development here at Guizueta. That sounds like lots of opportunities to get involved in the academic space at Guizueta. And in terms of social events, what sort of events do students at Guizueta most look forward to? One social activity that all of our students really look forward to is our international potluck where students dress in their traditional attire and they share food from their home countries and it's a lot of dancing and singing and it's gotten to be so popular that we actually offer it usually two times a year or each semester for the students because we have a very global program. About a third of our students are international and uh, coming from all over the world. I think that that's the one that all students probably look forward to the most. But it's a very social, small, collaborative, like I've mentioned, we have social activities every week. Classes typically Monday through Thursday. We do some classes during the first year on Friday. So kids in the courtyard on Thursdays and students kind of relax and unwind from the week. And a lot of faculty so interact with students at that time as well and staff. And it's definitely a social atmosphere. And why should candidates get their MBA in Atlanta of all the cities in the U.S.? More than getting their MBA in Atlanta, they should get their MBA from memory at Guizueta. But Atlanta is a great city. I mean, it's a cosmopolitan city, number three in Fortune 500 headquarters in the U.S. It's a city of more than 5.5 million people. Students 
love living in Atlanta because it's a dynamic city, but it's a very affordable city. So when you compare it to other large cities in the U.S., it's very affordable. Yeah. There's plenty to do, plenty to see. We've got the world's busiest airport, so students can have direct flights to most cities um, domestically as well as internationally. And so I think that that's important. You're not too far from the mountains. You're not too far from the ocean. This city is so diverse and we've got sports, you've got art, you've got so many cultures that are here. And I just think that it's such a fun place. Students really come and end up loving living here and oftentimes want to stay here. They don't want to leave once they graduate. Yeah, everyone I know that has either lived or visited Atlanta has absolutely loved it. I've never been there myself. It's definitely on my to-do list of places to visit. If we could talk about your admissions process now, what type of candidate is Goizueta looking for? And maybe we could also talk about whether you're looking for different types of candidates for your one-year program versus your two-year program. Like other top MBA programs, we want academically and quantitatively prepared students with progressive work experience to share in the classroom. We want to enroll a diverse class that has strong interpersonal as well as language and team skills. I'm proud to say that almost for two decades now, we have personally interviewed every candidate before Mm. offering them admission. And most of that's done by our admissions team. We do have alums that help us in Atlanta. And this year, we're actually expanding that to a few other cities that we may have some alums do some interviewing. It's very important to us to make sure that candidates are the right fit because we are such a small program and we want to be sure that students are going to be very collaborative. And we do have competition. It's good to have some internal competition. It's, it's healthy, but it is very collaborative and you're going to get to know all of your classmates really well. So we want to be sure to have the right mix. We want to craft a class that makes conversations and group projects really interesting and it's really important to us. With the one-year program, something that in the admissions process that we're looking for is that we do look for students that are undergraduate degrees in business or they've had certain business courses. For example, someone has had financial accounting, microeconomics, statistics. Those courses can be really helpful to have already had before you enter the one-year program, but in quantitative courses. So someone that's been in engineering can be a great fit for the one-year program because they have a lot of quantitative courses. So that's something that we look for. If they've done well in their undergraduate, obviously that's important too because the one-year program is so accelerated. The core you do in 10 weeks. In the two-year program, you do the core in 15 weeks. So it's, it's quite a bit accelerated and we need to be sure that students come from kind of a, a business or quantitative background. So that's the biggest difference as well as as I've already mentioned, kind of looking at your career goals and that you do not need an internship to, to meet your goals. In the one-year program, there's not that internship opportunity, so you need to be sure that you can build on your past experiences in making the move to your next job. Great. And if an applicant doesn't have that quantitative background or that engineering background, that business background, or does have that background but didn't score so well in his or her undergraduate GPA, could those candidates make up for that with a higher quant GMAT score? We're looking at the entire package. So if someone doesn't have those quant courses, they can take those quant courses. Students that have applied, we think they're a good candidate, so we require them to take them before they enroll. Right. If they have not done as well in their undergraduate record, they definitely can show us through their test scores, the GMAT or the GRE, that they have those quant skills. So we definitely look at all the academics, the test scores, as well as GPAs and any coursework that a student has had since then. So we're going to be looking at all of that. I noticed that Goizueta has four essays this year of 300 words, 250 words, 200 words. These are limit word limits. And finally, 25 words. And the question is, please share with the committee and your future classmates an interesting or fun fact about you. So I'd like to ask you about that 25 word question. And also generally, if you had any advice for candidates who have less than 800 words to tell their story. Well, we're excited about our essays, and so while it may be a challenge, we want to hear from MBA applicants about their post-MBA plans and accomplishments as succinctly as possible. We do not recommend going beyond the stated word limits. We get those questions a lot. I think it's important to stay within the word limits and to follow directions, but 
I always tell candidates, if you get to the end of your essays or your application in general, and there's something that you still feel that you need to share, a weakness in your application or just something about you that you've not had the opportunity to be able to do so at this point, that that is what the optional essay is for, to give you the opportunity to share that information. Because sometimes that's the case. And I tell candidates, if there's something that you feel is a weakness in your application, it is so important to share that information in the optional essay because you do not want us to be wondering what happened during that sophomore year and undergrad that this student you know, didn't do very well in certain courses or the semesters. It's best to address that. If they taken the GRE or GMAT and have not scored like they would like to, or you know, if they want to share more about how many times they've taken the test and what they've done to prepare for the test and why they feel that they could be a good candidate and that they need to share more information about their test scores, that's the place that they can do that. So that's the optional essay. And I think that with your question with the 25 words fun facts, we're always interested in learning fun facts about the students. And actually at orientation, we introduce the class we like to share a lot of fun facts about who's in their class. It's really interesting to see. And so we read lots of applications, and I think this will be a fun way to really get to know the candidates and learn something about them personally. So we're excited about reading those this year. I noticed that you have four deadlines this fall. Do candidates have a better chance if they apply in round one or round two versus round three or round four? Well, we really encourage candidates to apply when they're ready, when they feel that their application is the best that it can be. However, I encourage candidates to definitely apply in round one, two, or three, because round three is our final deadline to be considered for scholarship, and we have a lot of great scholarship opportunities and want students to be able to you know, be considered for those. And so if you wait till round four, that's past our scholarship deadline and the funds, there's, they're not as available. And I think that we do suggest for candidates in the one-year program to try to apply in round two because that program starts so much earlier. So we're working with a two-year and a one-year program and one starts in May and one starts in late July. So it's helpful for one-year candidates if students are thinking about that program to apply early because it starts in May. So round two, but candidates are considered for all our programs, the one-year, the two-year, if you apply in round one, two, three, or four. Right. The other thing I want to mention that I think is really nice and I think helpful for students because if a student is not sure if they want to apply to our two-year or our one-year you can apply to both of those programs on one application. You do not have to decide which program before you apply, which I think is great. We do ask what your program preference is. So if you're thinking, I'm going to apply to the two-year, but hey, I also want to be considered for the one-year, you can list both those on your application, as well as we have an evening and executive, and you can apply to those programs. But students, if they do apply to both programs, they are going to get a decision for each of those programs. So the decision could be the same, but it could be different. So I wanted to share that sometimes students like, I've got to make a decision before I apply, but that's not the case. You can actually wait, and I think, you know, students can get admitted to both programs, and then that allows them time to talk to current students and talk to the career center to find out maybe which one is um, the best option for them. I think that would make it a lot easier for your applicants. And just one more question I had about your GMAT. Do you have a minimum score for your GMAT? or a target score that candidates should aim for. And my other question is, Gwizweta accepts the GRE as well. Is there a minimum GRE score to shoot for um, that you're looking for? When it comes to the GMAT, we want students to try to fall within our GMAT ranges. And uh, we have those ranges listed on our website. For the two-year program this year, um, the students that just enrolled at a 620 to about a 730, um, for the one-year program, the GMAT range is 550 to 740. So with candidates, we encourage them to try to fall within those ranges. We obviously have averages. You know, our average for the two-year program this year is a 680. But I always tell candidates, there's a range around that average. And what's really key is to try to fall within the 80% range because you know, there's 10% above that range, 10% below that range. And we really focus a lot on the quantitative section of the test. So it's important 
We'd like to see candidates above the 50th percentile in the quantitative section of the GMAT or the GRE. When it comes to the GMAT, if you've taken it one time and you feel that you're capable of a better score, we encourage you to take it again because not only are you being considered for admission, you are also being considered for scholarship consideration. It's common to see students take it two or three times. If you take it three times and you score in a similar way, that's probably your score. But I encourage candidates to, to definitely consider taking it if they think it's that you're capable of a better score. We have less than 10% of the students that enroll in our program take the GRE. We take either. But typically, what I encourage candidates to do is GRE provides a comparison tool where you can put in your GRE score and you can kind of see what that would be equal to a GMAT. And, uh, and so put your score in, kind of see where you fall if it was a GMAT, and then see if that falls within our GMAT range. Great. I really appreciate that straight advice with the GMAT. So target that range and try to score high on the quant section. And what are your thoughts on the new IR section of the GMAT test? Uh, do you guys really weigh that score heavily along with the AWA score? I think it is a good piece of information to have on candidates. We just had it really for this past year. I think we'll use it more and more. I mean, we look at the entire school. I mean, we're going to look at the AWA. We're also going to look at the integrated reasoning. But I think that we typically are going to look most closely at that quantitative score. And I think that the integrative reasoning is information that is helpful on a candidate. So it's definitely something that we look at. And finally, could you give any last tips to applicants to help them improve their chances? I think it's helpful for candidates to definitely review our website to really understand our program, especially when they come to interview with us. It's helpful that they've done their research and they ask some really good questions, not something that you can find on the website. And I think that it, it shows that they've done their research and that they're genuinely interested in our program. And I tell candidates, you really should be yourself and let us really get to know you through the essays as yeah. well as the interview. We want to know about a student's professional accomplishments, but also interested in getting to know them as a person and how they're going to fit in on a team. Don't do your application like you think the school wants it. You know, be yourself. Obviously, present a really solid and well-thought-out application, but that you've demonstrated your quantitative skills. You can do that through, obviously, the courses that you've taken in undergrad. If you've not had any quant courses, that is okay. We look at all undergraduate majors, but that you show you've got the quantitative ability through your test scores. Candidates spend a lot of time on their, their applications and spend time on their essays. We read your essays. Those are the three things that I would highlight to really encourage students to do to improve their chances of admission to Coursera. So Libby just dropped a big hint to all of you that talk to students, talk to students, talk to alumni, right? Go beyond just the website to figure out what Guizueta is all about. And one last question, Libby, I had on admissions is I noticed that you allow candidates to interview before they submit their applications in round one and two. Is that correct? That is correct. And we have open interviewing until November 20th, which is our round two deadline. It's great when candidates are proactive and interview with us on campus or off campus. You know, we're traveling to a number of cities domestically and internationally, and we want to meet with candidates. And interviewing is such an important part of our application. And so we give students that opportunity. Don't feel like you have to wait till you apply to be invited. And so I think it is a great opportunity for students pretty much all the way through the fall semester, which gives you lots of time to be able to take advantage of that open interviewing period. And then after that point, we review applications and then it's by invitation. Got it. So it's no disadvantage to an applicant to interview with you guys before they apply. I think that it just shows that they're really interested and they're being proactive and wanting to interview with us. I think that it is important that before you interview, that you look at the application, that you thought about the essays. You want to be sure that what you say in your essays is what you say in your interview, and you don't want to do your interview so early that when you start doing your essays that you've changed your plan, your career plan. You want to be sure that you have definitely reviewed the application and looked at the essays and that you're consistent on what you're sharing with us in both those areas. In terms of financing um, the MBA at Goizueta, what percentage of your class gets scholarships? And can you let us know your average scholarship amounts? Well, more than half the class has some type of scholarship. I don't have the actual average, but they range from 20% to 100%. Ideally, you apply in round two or no later than round three. 
something that we focus a lot on with candidates that receive scholarships is that you need to include your leadership and community involvement in your application. And there are sections within our application to do that. Right. Typically, students that receive a scholarship are above our GMAT and GPA averages. Um, they have strong leadership skills and a personal skills in addition to their strong professional experiences. So it's someone that looks up, you know, that's above the average, it's really well-rounded and will be able to contribute a lot. To the yeah, and it makes sense that with a relatively small class size, that leadership and community impact would be at the top of your list when, when awarding scholarships. I also saw on Bloomberg Business Week that there were 44 full tuition scholarships. Right, we do. Wow. We are very generous and we give tuition scholarships and our most prestigious scholarship is our Woodruff Scholarship. And four students receive that and they have actually a stipend as well which is the only scholarship that we have that offers a stipend. Do candidates have to apply separately for those scholarships? They do not, which is great. Just by applying to our program, if you are admitted to our program, you are automatically considered for scholarship, which is great. And students, like I said, just be sure that you apply before that final deadline for scholarship, which is round three. And in terms of loans, does Goizueta offer any special loan opportunities for international students? We do. We actually have a loan that does not require a U.S. co-signer for international students, and the student may borrow up to $50,000 a year to a maximum of $84,000 for the total program. So it's a great option for international students. Oh, fantastic. And do you know what the interest rates are on those loans? I do not, but it should be on our website. I'll definitely link to that page, which has that option for international students. So you don't need a U.S. co-signer. You can apply for loans directly through the university. Now if we could talk about careers, which is always my favorite part of the conversation. Goizueta has some really impressive career statistics. You know, Bloomberg Business Week ranked you guys number one for increase in salary in 2012. And you have an extremely high placement rate. Could you just share a bit more about what unique recruiting advantages Goizueta has and what the reputation of your MBAs are not not just in Atlanta and in Georgia and the Southeast, but in the U.S. and in the world? Well, we have had great success, and we've had 100% internship placement for the last decade, um, 98% full-time offers by three months post-graduation uh, for 2012, and we're, um, 2013 is looking very similar. Um, those stats will come out in October, and our salary was over $103,000, so we have had great success. And I think that our students are known for being really well prepared for the interviews and their jobs. As I've mentioned in our conversation, we're committed to day one readiness. Um, And several years ago, we actually updated our core curriculum to fully integrate our curriculum, our co-curricular, and our career prep into the first semester. And so students have access to peer as well as alumni and career coaches. So I think that the combination of all that has really made them very well prepared. And I think that recruiters notice that. We're located in Atlanta. We start working with our students really early. And we have a very engaged global alumni network. As soon as a student commits to coming to Cozueta, once they decide, okay, I'm going to enroll at Cozueta, which oftentimes takes place April, May, and even earlier for our one-year students, students can start working with our career coaches. So they are able to get resume feedback. There's so many summer programs that take place now before the MBA program starts. And so we work closely with our incoming students and prepare them for those different conferences. We're part of the Forte Foundation. We're part of the Consortium for Graduate Study and Management. There's lots of organizations and summer seminars that companies provide. We're working with students very early in the process, making sure that they're prepared. So once they get here, they really already interacted with our career center, and uh, they can really start working either through our professional development program, which is our program that I've mentioned briefly, that our professional development program is a class that's built into our curriculum that students take if they're pursuing um, or seeking a career and want to use the resources of our career center. So so all the career workshops take place during that course, during the semester. And so students that want to have access to the resources of the career center are required to take that course. And what is the benefit to students of having a peer or an alumni career counselor? Well, we 
have done is that we have peer career coaches, so second year students that have assisted first year students throughout the internship process. And in the one year program, we actually have recent alumni that help mentor and coach the one year students. And I think that students have found, wow, you know, when I have a peer career coach or a recent alum, especially like in the two year program, students can get guidance on what they should be thinking about right now for this internship. And the person that's coaching them as a peer did what they want to do. So they've been through this just last year. And so really can guide them and assist them and say, hey, you need to be thinking about these informational interviews. You need to reach out to these alums and kind of help guide them. And so we've found it really valuable to have the peer as well as the recent alumni um, as kind of coaches. And as well, we have our directors that are in our career center that are focused within particular areas of interest. They have industry experience, and our students work closely with them. So they have lots of opportunity to be coached. And how many full-time international students stay in the U.S. to work after they graduate? We have a number of students that are actually sponsored by their companies and return to their country. But we have many other international students that are coming and are seeking jobs. And a lot of them are able to stay in the U.S. Many take advantage of the OPT which is the optional practical training for one year that you can do with the student visa. So there's that opportunity. But a number of students, um, international students, they have been able to stay. But then we have some international students that want to go back um, to their home countries or to other countries. We work closely with our international students. We want them to be successful, and we work with them on which companies interview and recruit and hire international students and kind of guide them throughout the process as well. Does Goizueta have particularly strong career networks in in any uh, region of the world outside the U.S.? We have alums all over the world, in Latin America and in India and in all over Asia and Japan and Korea, but definitely in a lot of the Latin American countries as well as India and Japan, Korea. Those stand out to me as areas that we definitely have very engaged in active alumni. And just to end on this career section, what is the most common way that students find jobs? Is it through talking to alumni or is it through the Career Services Center that you guys have or something else that I, I didn't mention? As I mentioned, Career Services starts to work with the students before classes even begin and students have access to a number of companies that come here to recruit our students for the internship as well as the full-time offers. They come and they do presentations, they interview our candidates, but we also, we end up taking our students to visit companies. So we have actually a week that is in the first semester um, for the two-year students. This is for the two-year students. It, we call it career week. Um, and then we take career treks. So we actually so we hear the students, you know, where is it that you want to go? What companies do you want to visit? But oftentimes we're going to Boston, D.C., New York. We do things in Atlanta. We've been to Charlotte. We go to the West Coast for technology. So we have gone a variety of different places. And as I mentioned, it can vary from year to year depending on where our students want to go. But we take career tracks that allow the student to explore internship and full-time job opportunities. Yeah. Could be some companies that maybe don't recruit on campus if they're a smaller company or an area that doesn't do the typical MBA recruiting process. Then, you know, we have such an engaged alumni that we connect our students with our alums and can be able to assist students in getting job interviews through that network as well. So it's a variety, but we have so many companies that come and visit and do presentations and uh, have networking events after the presentation to be able to interact with the students. So that's probably where the majority end up. But we also encourage our students to go to a lot of the big career fairs. So National Black MBA, as well as Nishimba, um, National Hispanic MBA Conference, Career Conference. There's a number of them. And uh, and we encourage all students that are seeking to go to those career fairs because all students are welcome and they're able to interact with companies and maybe some companies that, that don't recruit on campus. And speaking of students and alumni, I mean, what is the best way for candidates to reach out to this community and really learn firsthand, you know, what, what the experience is all about? Well, we have on our website something we call Guizueta Connection, and it's a link that students can go to, and you input some information, and you're able to have access to current students as well as recent alumni 
that you can contact directly, and it gives you information about where they're working and their email address. So it's the easiest way and the quickest way to be able to interact with our students as well as alumni. I'll be sure to link to that page, Goizeta Connection. Is there anything else about the Goizeta MBA that you just wish more candidates knew about? I actually have three things. The engaged and accessible alumni that we have worldwide. We have a very vibrant alumni mentor program that is open to all students, but students talk about how responsive our alumni are. As a small program, we may not have as many alums as our peers, but the quality and the engagement is superb. So I just want to emphasize that because I think that when students get connected to our alumni, they respond to our students. Even though five alums, you're going to get probably five responses. So they're very engaged and very responsive, and I think that says a lot about our community. The second thing is our accessible faculty. Our faculty have an open work policy. They want to get to know the students inside and outside the classroom. Nearly two-thirds of the faculty teach, conduct research, or consult outside the U.S., and they bring truly a global perspective into the classroom. And student feedback about our faculty consistently mentions the quality and accessibility and the commitment to student success. Many are industry experienced, so they have their MBAs in addition to their PhD degrees, which is just neat. Yeah. And so I wanted to share about our faculty as well as Roberto Guzueta. So our business school was named in 1994 for Roberto Guzueta, and he was chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola company from 1981 to 97 um, when he died. Uh, Mr. Guzueta's values and vision remain very prominent in our students' experiences here at Guzueta. The seven core values that you review your website, you may have come across, but are more than the heritage of Roberto Guzueta. They are the foundation of our intentions and the aspiration of our actions. And so they are the principles which we lead. And I'll tell you those uh, core values. There's seven, and it's courage, integrity, accountability, rigor, diversity, team, and community. And so all of these are very important to us. You know, I think that one of our essays, as we've talked about essays, is that you watch a video of Roberto Guzueta, and then you answer a question. So this is something that is important to us and that really students see throughout the program. Each semester, students nominate people within their class that has really shown all, all the different core values. And so it's something that's really important to us. I'm so glad you talked about the heritage of the business school as well as faculty. I think many times faculty sort of get left out of the picture when candidates are researching schools. And I mean, yes, there's career opportunities, networking opportunities, but so much of the business school experience is in the classroom. You're going to be spending a lot of time and putting in a lot of hours of work. And so you really want to make sure you're learning from the best and the brightest and the most international, as you mentioned. This year, Libby, you gave candidates 25 words to tell you something interesting about themselves. So I think I'll put you under the spotlight and ask you, what three words would you use to describe the program? Well, I think that um, rigor at first. We're really very academically rigorous program. We talked a lot about experiential. So experiential is my second. And the third would be engaged community or just engaged. If I can only say three, it would be rigorous, experiential, and engaged. I think those themes have resounded loud and clear throughout our conversation. Thank you so much for your time, Libby, and, and for being on the Touch MBA podcast. Thank you, Darren. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up and we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.